as regards data transfers, and the other one was a reprimand for uh, Frontex, who had moved to the cloud without a proper data protection impact assessment. And finally, in this year, in 2022, we launched, initiated, and participated in the coordinated action from the European Data Protection Board on cloud-based services for the public sector. So that's sort of the supervisory part. And then for our own data processing operations, we, of course, did our transfer assessments. We looked at whatever we have and as personal data processing. But at the same time, we were working hard to showcase how EU public administrations, such as the EU institutions, can be supported in working on solutions, enabling full control of data transfers and personal data processing operations. And this is why very recently we have launched as the EDPS two social media platforms, EU Voice and EU Video, which is an offer for all EU institutions, which has surprisingly no ads, um, no profiling, and in particular, no international data transfers. And very recently, we as the EDPS, we have negotiated with a European vendor um, a collaborative cloud uh, productivity suite on Nextcloud, which also every other European institution can order and make use of, which again surprisingly has data protection compliant contracts and no data transfers. So having said this, it is my pleasure now to introduce to you my four guests for this panel. They're all excellent professionals. They come from different walks of life, different parts of the EU, but they have all worked with passion and intensity in the last years to meet the challenges of the Schrems II judgment, and they get things done. So I'm very excited to uh, share them with you here and hear their experience. Uh, let me start with Ms. Magdalena Cordero on the very left. She is Director of Information workplace and innovation at the European Court of Auditors since 2008. She's a mathematician and she splits her professional career between data analysis and information technology. Her focus is on digital audit and organizational transformation. Then further to her right and to my left is Ms. Raluca Peika, Director General of Information at the Court of Justice of the European Union. Yes, that one. And um, before joining the court in 2007 as director of IT, she was head of unit in charge of EU systems, for example, for internal security, SIS2, for border management and asylum with the EU agency, EU LISA. And before that, she worked in NATO headquarters in Brussels. Her special interest is in, in merging technologies, digital transformation, and obviously as well as privacy and security challenges. Then, um, not yet online, but hopefully very soon, we have also with us um, Mr. Peter Paricek, who is the head of the German Competence Center for IT in Public Administration. It's the think tank for digital transformation in the public sector, established at the Fraunhofer Institute Focus in Berlin. He's also vice rector of the Danube University in Krems in Austria. And his focus is, um, again, digital transformation, future trends. And if you go to his website, the website of Öf IT, you can do a self-assessment on how your organization fares when it comes to digital sovereignty. And then, last but not least, on my left, we have Mr. Jan Philipp Albrecht, who is currently Minister for Energy, Agriculture, and Digitization of the German Land Schleswig-Holstein. And as of June, he is one of the two members of the executive board of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. It's a globally acting Greens think tank. But probably most of you will remember him from his time from 2009 to 2018 when he was member of the European Parliament from the Green Party and rapporteur of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. So let me turn to Magdalena first. Magdalena, 
What can you share with us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much to all of you for uh, being in this room so crowded. Just for those who are standing up to say that there's some free seating here, some free spaces, so you can just pass. So to avoid repetition, and because we, many, many people is going to talk after me, hmm, I decided to, to take the, the, the issue from a, let's say, a bit financial and political level, representing a bit the institution I'm working. I mean, we are the, if I'm working at the European Court of Auditors, I need to talk about funds and money and Europe, and I think it's natural. I want with all of you to go back and to travel to this July 2020. July 2020, when the judgment was made public. Hmm? At that moment, Europe had invested quite a lot, and a lot of budget also, on, on, on the GDPR. At that moment also, and the, we have a quite recent European Commission, only one year, that arrived thinking about the digital Europe with a very, very interesting project of uh, raising the maturity of Europe in digital in general, having three very important lines. One the, of domains, the human domain, the economical domain, and the social domain. Of course, we were in 2020. This digital Europe was published in February. What happened in March? In March 2020, we were all, most of all, most of us sent home. From a physical point of view, everything stopped. But from a digital point of view, it flourish. Allow me to say that I want to thank all the people working on IT during this period. Everybody thought about the doctors, of course, yes. But I always have in my deep thinking that IT did a lot. Did a lot for our health, huh? because we were at home and we could communicate in a very stressful period. And we did a lot for our works, because we were, we were able to continue working. It was the investment in digitalization, the biggest that I could never imagine. Nobody could imagine that we were going to do so well. Nobody, nobody. It was impossible. I have facts. We were projecting ourselves in January that maybe in 2025 we will be, we will be where we were already in April 2020, a lot. Everybody reacted, and everybody reacted investing a lot on digitalization. On which type of tools? On tools that were available. And what were the tools that were available? The tools that were provided by third parties, other countries, because the tools available were mostly from the United States. Other for other parts, but mostly from the United States. This big uh, reaction, this big uh, React, European uh, adaptation, I would say, uh, has generated something, has a consequence. After that, in July, we were more and more dependent than we were already in March from products from the United States. What happened already also in that month of July? The pandemic, the COVID-19, not only was a, a, a health crisis, it was also a financial crisis, an economic crisis. And the European Union had to react. And how? In July, in the Council, the president uh, the, the, of all member states decided to create an ins a, a financial instrument. It was called Next Generation EU. 750 billion U uh, euros to be distributed to the member states. But there were conditions. So to be invested on environment, Digitalization and social aspects. Digitalization is going to take at least 20% of that budget. This is an enormous amount of money to inject in the European economy for digitalization. But once again, what could be the problem? The problem is that it's not an investment on research, on creating new tools, on pushing the necessarily the European solutions is on pushing digitalization. And how this digitalization is going to happen? 
maybe a part of it is going to be using European tools. But a big part of it is going to be, and is going to be based again and more on America. Let's be realistic, it's going to be like that. Europe doesn't have the capacity to manage that volume, cannot offer service to the level. And here we are not talking only about creating research centers, we are talking about millions of small and medium sized enterprises that to, digital is to, to, to be digital, they need to use the tools that are already in the market. So we are, the future, when I look at it, I think we are going to be even more dependent. And we are talking about sovereignty. If you are dependent, there is a contradiction. Dependent to the states means that we are less sovereign. It's for sure, it's automatic. Let's use this definition of sovereignty, hmm? not to enter into conflicts. Because if we think that we are talking here about transferring data and data flows, no? can we use the same definition of sovereignty that for physical environment, for when you have borders, maybe we need to revisit the definition of sovereignty because maybe it doesn't apply in this context. But I'm here and okay, in this same in the same month is when the screen to that I'm not going to say what are the implications. It was it was uh, it, it was uh, made public. Huh? Uh, as you saw on my CV, I'm an IT person. I'm responsible for IT, and like like everybody that was responsible for, for IT, I have to react. If you ask me, huh, how did I react? Basically, two things. One thing, one aspect: the evolution. Uh, the evolution, we were, our plans were stopped. We were using some tools that we, ha we have stopped. We have stopped at the speed we wanted. This is the reality. And this is, and so some projects stop. Others, others not. Others didn't stop because we put an enormous effort on renegotiating contracts. We spent basically one year negotiating contractual clauses, having the data protection officer of the institution sitting with them every day, sitting with them and the legal service, within the legal service and the representatives from the vendor. That was what I, if I think about my image of the year after this rent too, is that is this Friday afternoon trying to start the weekend and not being able because we still need to negotiate another clause on the contract. Hmm? because we had many tools, and we were an organization that we thought that the cloud was the solution, software as a service was for us. We were too small for internal developments, we were too small for many things, so there was in our policy that we wanted to move to the cloud. So we have a lot of products, and we need to negotiate all of them. Huh? That, I think those who are in the domain can imagine how it was. But that was a very good thing, and I think it's what we need to continue doing, is that we need to put the vendors on it. So we need to put the pressure on the vendors if we want something to be changed. And during that period, I have different colleagues from different institutions talking, Madalena, what are you going to do? And they say, well, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm a manager. I'm an IT person, and I was trained to balance risk and value. And I, what I put in the risk, is a legal compliance? Because if I honestly think about the risk, the real risk, maybe I don't know, maybe I'm not so big, depending on how do you implement those systems. And what I put in the value is very high. So, and how are you, I, am I going to solve the issue? They were asking me, how are you going to solve it? And I said, but I'm very sorry, but I don't have a reply. I think that belongs to the political level. Politicians, they need to find the solutions for us. We are technical people with technical tools. We are not politicians. It has to be solved at political level. I re that was my, 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 my reply to many of colleagues in which we, with which we have conversations. And then I was uh, very pleased to see that in 25 of, it was my public, uh, 25 of, uh, of March when Mr. Biden was visiting Europe uh, due to the Ukrainian war. I, in this moment, I want to show my support with Ukraine, 100% supporting them. So when they came here to Europe and have this conversation with uh, Ursula von der Leyen, they talk about this, about how close we were to arrive to an agreement on a new framework huh, to 
let's see. Huh? Let's see if the new framework is there, and let's see if the agreement is there, and let's see if at a political level we are able to solve. I know that our colleagues from the European Commission started working on this and, and doing these hard negotiations with the United States since the day after uh, the, the publication. But let's hope that it's going to be for good, and let's hope that we will have a solution at political level. I know that some member states declare that the judgment is of impossible implementation as of today, because if no, we stop the economy. Others, they automatically stop any cloud solution. They have some, some organizations inside the country. But when you look at the figures of the dependency of those countries on cloud, and it's, it's going to be really, really very difficult. So I, I don't want to continue, because I have other speakers that are going to be there after me. But um, I, I really hope that once this uh, agreement will be, will be uh, the, the new agreement, a new framework will be signed, I hope that we will not have an stream three. Because it could be, it could be that we have a stream three. But I hope it's not going to be the case. And allow me to, to close saying that uh, with regards to, to sovereignty, maybe we need to think on a different manner. I like in the physical world, we decided who were our allies and who were our enemies. Maybe in this data world, we need to start thinking like that and find who are our allies and who are our enemies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magdalena. That's very insightful. And I'm sure we will have a discussion on your points uh, later with the audience. Um, I see with joy that we have our um, other panelists on screen already. Hi, Peter. But it's not your turn yet. It's um, first Raluca, who I would uh, like to ask to uh, give her views on, on these challenges and expectations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the audience that I have to admit that I have never imagined that is going to be so numbers. So thank you very much for coming. Um, in the next minute, I'm going to share with you not the view of the court, but the view of the CIO who was in the court and who had to walk the talk, uh, the judgment that was done, um, was delivered by, by our judges. And I do hope that, um, let's say, the, the experience that I get during this time is going to be useful not only for CIOs that are in the private, uh, in the public sector, but also in the private sector, because practically the, the problematics are the same. I would like to start uh, by saying uh, that we all the time focus in this discussion on the last uh, piece of the puzzle or of, of the flow. How we are going to make the implementation compatible with GDPR, with judgments like uh, Schrems 2 and so and so. But from my experience, what I have saw is that uh, practically this comes really much earlier. It's like a painting. It's always starting with the first dot. And it's very important where you are going to place that first dot, which color is going to be. Are you going to use acrylic or are you going to use oil? That's the strategy. And I believe that everything starts with the strategy. We are saying many times that the data is the new oil. Well, let's look to see how many of us, the CIOs, practically took this into account and starting to shape in our strategy what we are do going to do with the data. I'm going to share with you the reflection that we had in the court, which was practically to cluster the type of information in order to simplify the problem. So we look to our business and we have clustered the information in just three types. Judiciary information, everything that was related to the cases and processing the cases, administrative information, and public information. And then for each of these types, we have taken a line, a strategic line, on what we are going to do with the systems that are going to collect, to process, and to disseminate this data. And that made a difference, because we already saw from the beginning that we do not want to use other types of system than local system for some type of information. Then 
Um, another finding that I can share with you is the fact that um, I think 90% or even more, 95% of the public sector, private sector companies are practically undergoing a digital transformation. It's normal. Technology changes and we need to make use of the new uh, features, the new possibilities that the new technology is giving us. Now, one important thing is to put the first things first. And that means to put the data at the heart of the digital transformation. Not to think to the data at the end, but really to put it at the heart, in the center. That is going to make a big difference. And also to think which data is really useful and is going to add value to think about data quality and then all the things that are going to flow afterwards. Architecture is also important. If you have worked in IT, I don't know how many people are in IT here, or are we have only lawyers. <laughs> oh, I love to talk only to lawyers. Okay, <laughs> we feel in minority. Good, great. So, in IT, Historically, we always thought about architecture being infrastructure, applications, network, security. But what now becomes more and more important is data. Data architects, data privacy, it's very important. And it has to be really conceived from the beginning. So the words uh, privacy by design, it's, it's not a buzzword, I can tell you. That has to happen from the beginning. And also when you are conceiving um, an IT landscape that is going to really add uh, value to the business, doesn't matter if it's public or private, we have to think how that is going to evolve. And there we are going to see as well data which will flow not only inside our organization, but will cross the border. And then more um, questions will come up. Which kind of um, tools do we need to um, use in order to make really that data useful for uh, our business or clients or depending on the parties that we have? And there is the question of, okay, if we want to go in the market, have different tools, one of the advice is know very well your vendors. As lawyers, you know very well that big companies have a very complex legal architecture. You have the mother company with a lot of subsidiaries. That's a first point to know who is the data processor, what is going to be the relationship between the, the different parties. That's essential in order to understand what you are talking about when you are going to make a contract. And then the tools. Tools are very important as well to understand exactly how the data is flowing. That is really a key in order to know if that's okay or not. Then it's a problem of um, really making a, a correct assessment, the private impact assessment. Design the legal measurements. Um, and you know better than me the topic of the um, uh, standard uh, contractual clauses or the EDPS recommendations. Each time there is a, a new contract and a new approach taken to take this on board. But also technical measures. And here, as um, a technical person, I can tell you that these technical measures make a difference. So it's always a mix between the legal, the uh, technical, but also the pre-assessment of the risk and the risk appetite or the value that that data is going to give. And when I'm talking about the technical measures, I just wanted to share three things with you. First of all, the usage or not usage of a cloud. What type of cloud? And I do hope that my colleagues are going to offer some uh, insights of what clouds that can be used, because it's not just the, the public cloud, but we have private cloud. We can we discuss as well about an interinstitutional cloud, or I mean, there are a lot of discussions there about the encryption, the encryption in transit and the encryption at rest. And this is very important to know the tools that you are employing, what kind 
of encryption they have, and if you can trust it. That's a question, a very good question. Can you trust the encryption when you do not see the code? And last but not least, there are as well mechanisms like the mesh mechanisms where practically keeping the data inside the um, network. And practically what does it mean? It means that when you design a solution for the customers, the partners, and so and so, you need to make sure that you do have the control of your data. And I'm talking here about access, encryption, about the rules that are in place, and so and so. Um, last but not least, this assessment and this um, design, it's, it's not a one-time exercise. So the fact that it's once done, it doesn't mean that it, the work is over. This has to be done each time there is a change or on a periodical, um, I mean, on a regular uh, basis. And of course, these are just few of the things that I can share with you today. And last but not least, you have asked about challenges, uh, Thomas, and I would like to just share one, which I believe that is an essential one. The situation in which we are today, to try to find tools or to ask the vendors to ad um, adapt the tools to respect the GDPR and judges like Schrems too. This is happening because the, tu the tools have been in the market first and then we came with the GDPR and the other judgments. So now the challenge will be, we have the technology which evolves. Are we able to work on the data privacy and to shape it in parallel with the technology evolution in order that when the new products will be on the market to be already ready with the privacy? That's a question maybe for the panelists or even for you, if you can share with us ideas on how that can be made. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. We will come back to your questions, I hope. Um, now, Peter, now I'm happy to give the floor, or the virtual floor at least, to you. Um, what can you share from us, from your practical experiences on the challenges of Schrems 2? Please, go ahead. Thanks, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, nice uh, hello. Um, from uh, yeah, from at the moment uh, from, from from Austria. I hope I'm I'm not. Uh, I, I hope I'm on a small screen and not big as a giant, so that I'm frightening frightening you. So and yeah, I will bring in some also. Uh, I will continue and and based on uh, what um, Magdalena and Raluca already uh, mentioned and then frame it in 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 one of the discussions which which uh, uh, which we have in in, in Germany um, and. Um, it's about the digital sovereignty, um, which is which is often uh, combined with uh, with the aspects of uh, of cloud technology. So digital the digital sovereignty um, um, became more and more important in the last I would say so in the five five uh, in the last five years. Um, uh, the the difficult uh, difficulty with this uh, topic is that there are so different so 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 different dimensions. Um, it, it, it's, it is about individuals, um, so digital sovereignty of individuals, uh, of companies, um, but also um, of, um, of, of politics. So how can we, how can we design digital society um, uh, um, and how, how can we design it like the way we want to design it and not driven by the, by the technology? And this is also um, one of the, the elements how you can define it, digital sovereignty. So the, in, the, the ability of individuals, companies, and politicians to freely decide how and according to which priorities the digital transformation should be shaped. And um, uh, it was also mentioned by the, by the German chancellor, uh, chancellor uh, in 2019 in the Internet Governance Forum. Um, and she said digital sovereignty is not pro um, protectionism. Um, but it rather describes the ability to shape the digital transformation. So this is more or less so in, in the core. And one of the elements which is often um, often mentioned is 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 is, uh, is the cloud technology. But I think it's maybe a little bit more than just just cloud technology. I, I will um, um, I will find some arguments a little bit, bit later. 
So, but why we are discussing so much about um, um, cloud um, technologies and especially digital sovereignty? Yes, of course, of RIMS, uh, um, um, Austrian colleague, but also um, I think uh, also one of the the starting points was also Snowden because it, that Snowden was 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 a flash to the extent of of uh, surveillance state um, and surveillance possibilities um, of um, intelligence services. Uh, but it think it's also the Trump pres um, presidency, um, so where we uh, lost a lot of trust because uh, we saw um, that uh, how fragile the transatlantic relations uh, are and how unstable West democracies, uh, uh, the West democracy has become over the over the past years. Um, but it's also about the consumer sector because um, more and more about um, the leaks uh, about Facebook uh, and, and other companies. Um, so that we um, more and more we get the full and also the evidence. So there was always a rumor, but now we really have also the evidence of the of how the the users um, are surveyed by the by the companies. And COVID nineteen also showed us um, a lot of um, yeah uh, consequences of our globalized economy. So and, and based on this lose of trust, I think this is one of the the reasons why we discuss so much about the, this this topic digital sovereignty and how we can deal with that. If you look to the to the public sector uh, and this and, and the public sector debate in in Germany or also in in, in, in Austria and in Switzerland, it's very similar. And I think these three countries are a little bit also um, could be uh, uh, could be countries uh, or could be compared to other member states um, who are a little bit more conservative or more data sensitive uh, or data privacy sensitive, like like other countries uh, like other member states in Austria, because. There are, diff there are big differences uh, if, if you look to the debate in, on the different national levels. Uh, in Germany, it's more the non-use of cloud technology. So because there are very rare examples where we really are using cloud infrastructure. And if that's the case, um, uh, the organization is not talking about it. Um, this is one aspect um, of, uh, of digital serenity in, in the public sector. And the second one is, uh, is more and more um, uh, as, as one solution could be um, the open source technologies or open source um, uh, for, for future um, services. Um, and based on this very, very critical discussion in Germany, um, the hyperscalers um, uh, started to discuss more and more with the public sector and develop. And some of you, I'm, I'm sure, have uh, also heard about it because now it's also becoming more and more an European aspect that they are changing their private cloud approaches. Uh, so they, they are building based on the private uh, on the public cloud. They are building on the public cloud and transform it to a private cloud. Um, so that they want to create something in, in Germany, um, um, which is more a private cloud. So it's there's no data exchange between that. that there's really no data exchange between Europe and uh, the United States. So that is one of the approaches which is discussed at the moment, which is also, I think, quite uh, interesting and could be one of the elements which uh, Raluca just mentioned to, to build hybrid architectures. Um, but um, for, the, for the discussion now, if you are looking to 2020, it doesn't help us very much because um, they, it will not be finished before, before 2024 um, uh, earliest. So um, this conservative attitude, uh, I think it's very critical. It's very critical because um, it's, it's, um, uh, it's limiting innovation um, and um, we need innovation in the public sector because otherwise uh, the citizens will lose trust in the public sector if the public sector is not able um, to provide uh, state-of-the-art state of the art services and for state-of-the-art development, you need cloud infrastructure. So um, this is this is um, this is more or less also our main recommendation um, to um, to start and also I think uh, uh, Raluca mentioned so many uh, great strategic elements to look um, at what kind of data you are processing what kind of services are they really so critical or can we start with using the the, the public cloud and maybe afterwards. Uh, we move it to a to a private cloud or to on-premise services. So to 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 develop a strategy where we are using all the elements which are available, and if not, so then the inability in the inability to act and shape the public sector is is really a risk, uh, especially in the in the data privacy sensitive member states such as uh, Germany and Austria, um, to the lack of uh, use of the current technologies. So the open source approach that looks promising. 
on on, on the first on the first side. So if you look at it, it's great. But um, we know also from the last twenty years that the open source approach very often was combined with shared repositories. And based on the experiences, we know that the shared repository in the beginning it's a good idea. But after some time, uh, more and more um, the, the, the scalability. Uh, and also um, the standardization is more and more you lose it after some time, especially if, if it's developed in public in the public sector, because we are so different, so the organizations are so different, so that they are start to um, to change it uh, and more and more you use, um, you, you are losing um, uh, the advantages of the open source. But open source, and that's, that's uh, more or less the, the first, almost the funny thing. If you, if you use open source, um, of the open source approach in a cloud, uh, in environment, then you have a very high standardization, then you have scalability, and then you can provide shared services in a public sector. So, um, so to combine open source with, uh, with, with cloud, with the cloud approach, I think that's, that's really one of the, um, this is really crucial. Um, brings me to the, to the, to the, maybe to the core aspect if, if digital um, serenity is, is mentioned. Um, I think digital serenity um, should more focus on the key technologies for the next 10 years. So where do you really want to protect the technology? Because we need that, because it's super sensitive for Germany, for Europe. Um, um, so um, that would be the protection approach. Um, we discussed that in the, in, uh, in the Digital Council, especially, um, especially uh, Victor Meyer schoenberger um, was promoting that. And the second issue is, do we expect influence so that we, if we are able to, de to develop this technology, maybe in a niche niche, uh, then we will be successful worldwide. So more focused on, uh, on, on, on value chains uh, worldwide. But it's not, and that's, I think that's, that's super important, uh, it's not cloud infrastructure because then we would just rebuild something which is already um, existing. Um, another approach, and that's my, my last element is, um, we can help also with with, um, with with the ongoing projects in Gaia X. That could be uh, a solution because Gaia X is focusing and uh, and also uh, I think Raluca you mentioned data flows. Um, Gaia X is not focusing to rebuild uh, uh, cloud infrastructure. It's focusing on that the data is able to flow between different cloud infrastructures or on promise. So with the help of standardization. Uh, so that we provide, um, so that we um, can hinder um, a lock-in effect, um, and that we we are able to move the data very quickly. And that brings me to my maybe to my to my last uh, issue that that uh, we very often with the concept of serenity, that's more linked to spaces and data is not. You can that's not possible to to data is not in one space. Data is in a flow. Um, so we need more to, to focus on, on flows and, uh, and that's the reason maybe that why digital serenity is so much mis is, is so much misleading. Um, yeah, um, and, and thanks for the invitation and, and I hope, uh, uh, and I hope that I can follow the discussion and bring in some, um, some issues which, which are interesting for the panel and, and for, uh, for the audience. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Yes, please uh, stay online and uh, uh, let's ask a politician now, um, how this can all work. Um, Jan, Philip. Thank you, Thomas, <clears throat> and uh, thanks for being here to all of you. I'm trying to uh, maybe just continue where uh, my uh, previous, uh, the previous speaker just stopped and take on board this question on digital sovereignty because I think that it is indeed to be clarified what do we mean with it and therefore we need to go back to the question what's sovereignty in general and uh, I would say that's important when you discuss about Schrems and um, about what has to be done in light of these judgments. Um, because for democracy sovereignty is mainly that the decisions of people are being implemented and respected. That's the core of democracy and rule of law. And uh, that, is, uh, that had to be built uh, in, in Europe on a European level uh, by sharing sovereignty between nation states and by building up institutions and, uh, and courts like the uh, European Court of Justice. 
and others in order to uh, ensure sovereignty in um, our common uh, market also, in our common uh, space of living. And we now see the same challenges in the digitized, globalized environment in which we are living today, which is uh, without uh, borders and boundaries in many areas. And the Schrems judgments are showing the necessities of building up sovereignty again, but not in the meaning as some have read out of it, that those judgments are there in order to say it's so evil what Americans do, and in particular their capitalist uh, companies like Facebook, etc. But in the meaning of that there is a lack of enforcement of the basic principles which we have voted for in democracy, in the European democracies, mainly with the Schrems judgments, by the way, that foreign citizens in the US didn't get the same rights as domestic citizens, in particular when it comes to the protection of their data and privacy in the field of national security. And this, by the way, is still not dealt with sufficiently, and that's why I think a safe privacy harbor shield won't work unless there will be legal challenges in law uh, on the side of the United States. Um, but I'm open for people who try um, and show me and the court uh, how they are dealing with it. Um, I also have my doubt that, for example, uh, adequacy decision with the UK or others uh, are to be upheld in front of the court in, in light of these uh, questions. But in the end, this is like the theoretical approach of, uh, in the end, looking at the judgments of the highest courts. What we need, of course, is um, legal frameworks, but in particular uh, practical legal frameworks, contracts, services built on what also has been said by the previous speakers here, uh, decisions of those who are building up the systems. And um, that is also what I would like to focus on, of course also in light of what I've said, which means that if we don't know if we can uphold sovereignty in the way how we want to have it, uh, by legal means only, we need to maybe be a bit more cautious on building it up uh, on technical, by technical means, or by also um, building up uh, opportunities for consumers to, uh, to mitigate risks on their own. And um, that is what has been done also in the recent years a lot in Europe by many uh, actors in the public and in the private sector. I can say that from my work, which I've been doing in the last four years in the uh, German state of Schleswig-Holstein, where we started to build up um, all the processing capacities we need for the public institutions and authorities on our own in Schleswig-Holstein without taking uh, the resources anymore of outside of our own country. So the whole hardware is built locally, um, but still by using services on this hardware from all around the globe, but on the basis of certain clear standards. And one has been mentioned already, and that's open source. Um, and although we have the um, strict rule that we do open source but not talk about it uh, because it works better, uh, I'm just outlining here that it is possible to do so and uh, to move um, almost all services in the back end in, in the, and in the front end for public authorities to open source based solutions, which we did um, and we will uh, finalize our works in, in the upcoming few years uh, by also replacing operating systems um, and others um, to, to really be clearly based on open source. Why do I also underline this? Because I think in the end, when we look on what is 
coming up. And when we look at the vast amount of data, which is globally, that's clear, um, we need to look not only at the data, that's clear for the services to look at what, what are, we, are we doing at all, but also we need to look at um, the, uh, the rules and the algorithms which uh, handle this data. And that can only be done by a transparent approach on assessing the code and on assessing um, how processes can be influenced, how processes can be controlled. And um, that is also important, by the way, for sovereignty. Because I cannot assure that my public authorities act in line with my local, regional, or national law if I can't assess the algorithms which they use to process data. And I think that should be crystal clear. It can only be done in a way that um, authorities can be um, controlled and overlooked um, in a way that they can clearly say, I have 100% insight in what happens. Um, therefore, I really think that these um, adjustments are far more important um, than hindering uh, services from the US or other places in the world to offer services here in the European Union or from hindering us or our public authorities even to share data with them. It has to be based on principles and clear legal standards. And that is what, like any agreement between the US and the EU, need to be based on in order to be sufficient. But unless it's not sufficient or not existing, I have to make sure that on my own. And that is what I uh, really see as possible for public authorities, but also for private companies, and to make clear that um, uh, also I see there a huge opportunity for, um, for many actors in the private sector to benefit from, from those uh, uh, developments. Because it will be clear in a certain uh, scale of moments that um, other judgments will follow and will assess if sovereignty is still uphold. And I think that it will be clear that public procurement, for example, for public authorities will be clearly very limited on certain services which bring um, the standards to control processes still, like open source, transparency, um, intervenability in the processes, and that is also because I think, in the end, all these processes which we are now digitizing, also as public uh, institutions, will be assessed even narrowly by like code of auditors or others, also in light of how we spend our money. And if it's efficiently uh, spent uh, on those services uh, which are need needed to, to really achieve the right aim, and, uh, or if it's uh, just serving another cause which is not uh, the public interest. And I think that this will be a strong uh, incentive also uh, to follow uh, the ideas which are uh, behind Schrems' uh, judgments more even uh, than uh, the importance maybe on, of new agreements or others, which of course are important in uh, a way for, for big companies coming into the European market in particular. But that's again where I don't really care so much. I more or less care about the question if we uphold uh, the standards and, um, and that is a matter of sovereignty, but that can be achieved also uh, uh, globally. And that's my final words uh, for this moment. I also think that, um, uh, as it has been said here already, we need to build up this sovereignty on a global uh, level. And that, again, is the question of sharing sovereignty uh, between, uh, for example, the EU and the US. But that is not built on the like trade agreement um, concepts of the past, but on uh, common standard contracts of the future. That is building up fundamental rights, human rights on a, a multilateral level, that is building up clear 
rules on data protection, on other questions on a multilateral level, things which haven't been done for around 20 years now, uh, and that uh, needs to be done. That's the next step. Uh, and I think everyone who calls for sharing more data on global level, which I am part of, has to call even more for multilateral agreements on a, um, uh, a standards approach uh, uh, base and, and for high standards uh, uh, enshrined in it in order to, to build trust. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Applaud. And I take it as applause for all our panelists. Um, because now it's your turn. Now it's your chance um, to ask uh, questions. I think we've had a wide variety of, of opinions, um, also on how to react to Schrems 2 and what it might mean in the future. So the floor is yours, literally. Um, whoever wants to ask a question, please. Um, there is a microphone here. And you can step up to the um, there. So, raise your hands, and if you ask a question, could I please ask you to uh, let us know who you are and which organization you belong to, and ideally, to whom your question is directed. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Erik Valgare. I'm a practicing data protection lawyer here out of Brussels. Um, I think the Schrems decision has put European companies in an impossible position. Uh, because unlike EDPS, they are not able to find cloud solutions that are 100% European. And unlike the court, they are not able to put pressure on the vendors to do whatever needs to be done to comply at some level. So my question is, you know, what, what did we really gain from Schrems? And how do we actually try and respect our own European message in terms of respect for private data if we put our own companies in a position where they cannot comply? And I think 80% of the organizations in the EU that export data out of the EU today are simply not complying, but they have no alternative. So how will we solve that puzzle ever? That's a question to the whole panel, I take it. Yes, please. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe we can collect one more question. There is a lady here. Yes, uh, from Julia Balash from the Danish National Police. And I can say the challenge is not only real for enterprises, but also for public institutions in smaller European states that do not have the possibility to employ like the Germans, uh, an administrative body with 5,000 um, people who work on uh, um, solutions. I think we also have an obligation to find um, cost-effective solutions uh, that uh, we have to pr show to our citizens that we actually, that's actually why we choose a commercial off-the-shelf products because it's cheaper. And, uh, and information security standards, I think nobody will disagree in Microsoft. Uh, are quite high and something that um, we would struggle to um, build ourselves with that same standard. Um, I just want to share one um, real, uh, uh, like everyday uh, challenge we have uh, in the Danish National Police with Schrems. And, uh, um, and that is uh, the Danish National Police has a website uh, where citizens can access information about the police, you know, like uh, public administration, administrative bodies. That website, of course, has this HCAPTCHA tool to determine whether a human tries to uh, see the website or not, uh, and that, uh, or, or a robot. That uh, HCAPTCHA tool is quite important to prevent that um, the website is put down because it gets uh, attacked by a lot of robots. The tool is developed in the US, and it doesn't collect uh, information that I would consider uh, very interesting for foreign intelligence services because it just says, or like the, the uh, personal information that is collected is um, how many people are trying to access the Danish website. For me as a practitioner who actually takes data protection quite serious, it seems we take um, data protection to an absurd level if we pretend that this statistical information of who's accessing a website 
needs the same protection as information about, uh, let's say, uh, name addresses of citizens or even criminal records. That is, I, I completely agree, would be something that we would not <laughs> put out uh, to um, uh, vendors, also for another a lot of other reasons uh, um, besides data protection. So I was wondering what the panel was, or maybe also the EDPS, if you want to extend your role in the uh, moderator, um, whether uh, we can actually, uh, if, is there a way where we can uh, have a risk-based approach looking at the data and saying like, is this data uh, in, uh, interesting for intelligence agencies and what would they be able to do with it? And uh, from that risk as, uh, assessment, then uh, make it possible to use some services. So that was my question, maybe comment, maybe frustration in this heat. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for sharing that and thanks for your question. Um, yeah, let me turn to the panelists. Jan, you wanna go first? I'm just happy to, to just ask back, why do you think that there is no alternative? Why do you think that every alternative has to be more expensive? There is so many companies in the European Union who work out services. And for example, we in Schleswig-Holstein, we only have 50 people working uh, in the area of uh, digitization for the public authorities. But we have a shared um, a contractor with other lender together who is working out all the services, including also the hardware of cloud providing services and all the other stuff. And we are completely, we, we, don't, we are not reliant anymore on any back-end service which is not hosted in that environment. And we produced it all on our own. And Schleswig-Holstein is not a rich state in, in Germany. Denmark is far richer. <laughs> and um, I, I... Okay. Let's, let's look into the details how far digitized. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to say there are alternatives on the market. And that's uh, my experience is just that in the European market, we just have an unwritten rule that certain, certain things like this picture caption can only be done by one service provider. Why? I mean, we have so many alternative actors on the market. It exists. They just don't get money to grow and to produce because public procurement is not going into their side but into the side of others. Why? I don't get it. And that's not, in the end, not a decision of rules. That's a decision of priority setting in procurement and of who to spend your money on. And you don't have to do that alone. You can do that with others together. Different member states of the EU could together do public procurement for uh, the service, for, for their police, for example. It's possible. Yes. Um, thank you, Jan. Magdalena, Raluca, Peter, maybe. Peter, I saw you shaking your head, but maybe Raluca. Yes, go for it. Well, I see the frustration. And as a CIO, I can tell you it is not easy. I see as well the challenges. But I see as well something else. The fact that in trying to find a good strategy, as I told you, the, the, the starting point. It's very, very important to understand what we keep inside, what we want to put outside, what is the value created. Then, like Jan very well said, looking to alternatives, and I fully agree with him that there are alternatives there, and it's our mission as well to search for the alternatives. We are doing something else, which I believe that is very important, and sorry to not be a politician, but I will say it, protect the EU values. Yes, we will struggle, we will find alternatives. It's not going to be easy for any of us, but what we will do, we will stick to what we said that is at the heart of EU, which is privacy. 
I'm pretty sure none of, of you can just raise the hand and say that, yeah, this, this can be, we, we can just give it up. No, we need to find ways to make it happen and still to preserve what we said that is important for us. And knowing what is out there, I can tell you, and I, I'm really agreeing with what Zian said, there are alternatives. Now, the question is, for all alternatives, there will be a, a kind of degree of features, functionalities. Do we need all of these? That's also a question that we need to ask ourselves, okay? And sometimes we might need as well to make a balance between what we will get and the fact that we are going to protect the data that it's not ours, but the data that is belonging at the end of the day to the US citizen. Police, it's having a US citizen in there. So each of our decisions is, is practically going in that direction. Then um, the question was, what do we gain? I will not say that we gain really something. I, 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 say, I would say that in a way, an effect of it would be that the EU products are going to be stimulated, to be searched, to evolved, to evolve, sorry, to be employed, that's an opportunity as well that I would see it. And I do not see um, really the economy stopping like it was implying in, in, in the question. What would that mean? It means that we have given the data to somebody else? I'm just asking this, if, if, if that is the perception. So sorry that I'm not having, a, let's say, a, a clear answer and I'm asking more questions, but I believe that the answers are going to be found um, in really thinking and contributing together. And again, the data that we are handling, at the end of the day, it's not our data. It's our citizen data. And we have a duty to it. So that's my view. Thank you. Um, Magda, yes? I think that most have been said. I just want to add something. Uh, we need to, we are confronted to also a resistance to change. Huh? Our organizations are used to work with some tools, with a model, and to change the model is difficult for everybody. And why is difficult for everybody? It's difficult because we have a behavior at home and we have a behavior at work. And some people is consistent. So some people is, uh, for them, data privacy is very important and they understand all the restrictions that you can put them on the uh, work environment, but, but most of them not. It means that the one pain for it is going to be the, the, the environment you have at work in which you are, of course, lacking functionality, user friendliness is different because we are all we have all a schema in our, our head, so we need to manage that chain. For people that then, when they go at home, they are 100% free, and they don't mind to use tools for which privacy is not necessarily protected. And this is the contradiction. If everybody that is, I mean, everybody's pushing for this privacy at the office, is also pushing for the same privacy at home, is when we, when we are talking about regulations that took into consideration what the people, the citizens want, that I am sure is a full democratic system, I believe it, is, is, is why we have those regulations. But if we go to the citizens and we see that in a majority they are using products that are not complying with this regulation, is where we have the contradiction. So, and it's something that also needs to be said, huh? that we are protecting uh, our citizens when they, in the deepest of their personal behavior, maybe they are not protecting themselves. And this is one point. Another point is that, uh, uh, personally, as responsible of IT on an institution, I try to find Europe. I mean, this is slogan of American first. Let's think about the Europe first. Europe first huh? You try to find solutions, we have some, we have some uh, open source, we, we try. But we are confronted very soon with issues. Uh, multilingualism, for example, is a very important issue for us. Many things. And then at some point, 
you are confronted with multilingual solution, multilingual solution for all European language. Who can provide me in all European language? And suddenly, you start, you have limitations and, and, and you know, if you want to react fast, maybe it's not possible. But I, I, I fully agree with Jan, maybe for different objectives. I think we need to support the European economy. We need to push, because you know, we need to push the, the European technology. I would like to, to, to see that hubs are here and there. I would like to be reproduced as many Silicon Valleys. I would like all those things to happen in Europe. And for that, I'm very sorry, but the only solution is that we need to start accepting that at the beginning, maybe, we are not perfect. Thank you. I Peter, I will give you the word as well, but first I want to give the audience another opportunity to ask uh, one or two more questions, maybe even directly to, to Peter. Hello, um, my name is uh, Guillaume Champeau. I work for a French hosting company which is called Clever Cloud. Um, just to go back to the, to the debate, I find it very revealing that one of the first uh, reaction in the audience is we don't have any alternative, and as you said, yeah, and there's Lots of alternatives, and I would be happy to find to uh, give the, the police uh, women uh, alternatives for capture uh, solutions that I know of actually two that uh, exist in France. One by Orange, uh, the other is open sourced, and made by Inoria. So there, there are solutions, but it's, it's really revealing that that the first reaction is that you have to use the incumbent products because. Uh, we are used to using this, uh, in most situations, American uh, products that exist. And, and the very positive effects of the Scrims 2 decision is that it pushes you to find European alternatives, or at least ways to keep the, the data in Europe. And to give you an example, uh, we had uh, decisions a um, few weeks or, or months ago by the French DPA, the CNIL, that said that using Google Analytics on a website is not compliance with the Schrems 2 decision. And we had a similar decision in Austria as well. And uh, the reaction from the market uh, at first was, well, we have to use Google Analytics because there's no alternative. And in fact, the CNIL published a list of dozens of alternatives that do exist. And it opened the market for, an instance, uh, an alternative that's called Matomo, which is open source, and you have European cloud providers, such as the one that I work for, that actually offers uh, hosting services for this kind of uh, alternatives that exist. So if the commission goes too quick into uh, signing another agreement with the US without having solid guarantees that uh, the data is actually being protected as it should be in the US, then it's stabbing on, on, in, the, in the back of the uh, European companies that are actually working uh, for uh, providing alternatives to the European uh, citizens and companies and administrations. And it's not something that we should rush into just because people are not aware of alternatives. So I'm sorry it's not the question, but if I can add a question, it's how do we change this mindset that makes people react that there is no alternative? How do we make these alternatives being more known uh, in Europe? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to pass the question to Peter, maybe for a brief reply. Um, any thoughts from you on this particular question or anything else? So maybe in general, because uh, even if I'm, I'm not here, um, you, uh, uh, there, there was, uh, yeah, um, uh, you mentioned it that, um, that I do not agree. Um, maybe it's, made, it's too absolutistic all the positions. Um, sorry for saying that. I think we we need to be uh, we need we need more more opportunities, different different approaches. Uh, and um, and Magdalena and and Raluca mentioned that in in, in their in their first statements. So um, it's not it's not black and white. Uh, and uh, and and we also need to agree that in some areas um, yeah, there is no um, there is no alternative because they. The, the leading companies, they are investing uh, billions every year you know, into improvement of their services. I absolutely agree. Um, what just was, was mentioned um, is that we, that we find very specific elements in cloud infrastructure, which can be, um, which can be developed by, by European, uh, by European uh, companies. I also agree to, with Jan, there's the possibility to, to build um, on-premise solutions and build that and include that, uh, incorporate that in, 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 hybrid, uh, in hybrid cloud, uh, cloud solutions. So 
if you're talking about mindset, then then it's um, then it's uh, what what one of the cases where Europe is so strong is um, is uh, is that we have different approaches, and I think we we, we should we, we should we, we should foster that that again. So and therefore we also I'm um, and um, so I will not. Um, I will not um, get uh, applause because I think we need a new agreement because it is hindering innovation in private and public sector. But from my position, very clear. So it is hindering innovation. Um, and second, we need uh, we need uh, we need different. Does it mean that we that we only uh, are using cloud providers? No, it does not. But we need a risk approach. It was mentioned. Um, it need uh, uh, it need to, to discuss what kind of data, which was mentioned, I think, by the Danish colleague. Uh, and then we find uh, solutions for for the different data um, um, uh, data elements. So is uh, for the different risks for the different services. Um, but I agree with Jan in, in that we definitely need to change public procurement because public procurement um, all over Europe, Europe we are we are focusing on the huge IT uh, on the huge uh, IT companies and not on the small and medium enterprises. What's very interesting. So, I agree with uh, in, in one in 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 one uh, topic. Uh, I agree with with Jan Philipp. We need to change definitely public uh, uh, public procurement. But that means also that the public administration needs to be more um, uh, takes a higher risk because if I if I make a contract with a with a smaller company, then the risk is is, is higher. Maybe that it fails. Um, maybe uh, at least on the paper, not in reality, but on the paper, and that's um, that's definitely one thing which which we need to uh, to change. So be more open, um, uh, open open our mindset. Uh, I think that's one of the uh, one of the elements where we are in Europe um, quite quite strong. We should use that. Thank you very much. And and on that note, since um, we have uh, abused our time slot, I think. What we have seen is, um, from a legal point of view, just that as a side note, of course, there is the legal obligation of data protection by design. That is a self-standing legal obligation which data protection supervisory authorities are enforcing. And part of that um, process is to say, you need to look for alternative products, obviously, which if there is a product which is better in privacy, then that is a strong indicator that you should be looking at that product. For the rest, I think we've seen a huge awareness in you, in the audience, on the panels, in public administrations coming out of the, uh, not only the GDPR, but also the Schrems II judgment, um, not only on data protection, but also on other aspects like economical um, dependencies, vendor lock-in, in compliant contractual solutions. So that's been a feeding ground. I would even say we in Europe, we are now realizing that we have to wean ourselves off of this new shiny bright technology which we have gotten used to. We are growing up and um, thank you very much to you, your audience, and to my stellar panelists here and in the online world. Um, see you next time. <laughs>